Thank you so much, and uh, please uh, pardon my voice. Um, we're actually lucky that I could even speak today. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so remember two months ago, I was uh, a student. So, um, and uh, I've been telling uh, my friends that, you know, uh, this is probably a kind of, uh, I'm paying for all the abuses that I did uh, months before cramming to finish a dissertation. Anyway, so, um, what I'm doing, uh, what I'll talk about this afternoon is basically uh, a sub-chapter of my dissertation. Uh, so this is uh, basically findings of my dissertation in half of a chapter of that dissertation. Um, so first, uh, I'd like to, um, you know, I, it's, it's been mentioned earlier that uh, the Worcester images are actually um, uh, present on the web. It has a kind of uh, online life. And uh, well, first, you know, maybe we should try to think about uh, the Worcester images, um, you know, beginning in the age of digitization. And, um, but before that, of course, there were efforts before the digital era to uh, reconnect them, and so to speak. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in the late 70s to early 80s, uh, Carl Hutter, um, the, the former uh, curator of the Anthropology Museum here, um, did a project with, um, the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, to um, actually provide, um, to have um, preservation copies of the images. And, and, and in his report, he did mention that uh, it's really necessary that we try to trace all the Worcester images located in several institutions. Uh, so there's that effort to um, reconnect and recombine all the Worcester materials albeit in the analog uh, world, uh, by having a cross-reference catalog, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, uh, in 1998, the uh, Imperial Imaginings came, and this is actually my first interaction with the Worcester collection. I was still a museum studies master's student and at the University of the Philippines, and my professor then, Anna Labrador, came back from um, Michigan and showed me the image. and. I never actually imagined that at some point it will figure in my career <laughs> as an academic, but here I am talking about Wooster. <laughs> so, um, so the Wooster images online, uh, that, that, uh, we, we like to talk about the Wooster images and its afterlives, and one of the lives of uh, the Wooster images would be online or virtual. Um, so, you know, it's available in online databases. Um, I would call this the deep web. Uh, there are two kinds of things that you find online, right? There's the surface web, things that you find on Google. When you Google something, you find it, but not, you don't find everything on Google, and that's the deep web. And online databases would be those. So meaning um, this is available online. It's definitely, definitely virtual. You will find it but it's harder to find, and you will have to know where they are because they're in specific password-protected online da databases. So Haverford College, for instance, is there. Um, you will see the Wooster images uh, or in their collection through their online catalog, and the Smithsonian uh, Collection Research Center would also have the Wooster images in their catalog, but you know, if you Google it, it's hard to find it. You, know, you have to do a little bit of uh, searching. Of course, there are virtual exhibits that are found in Surface Web. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, the museum here has uh, an online exhibition. So does the MIT uh, Visualizing Cultures uh, project has a, an online exhibition of the Worcester images from the images here at the university. Or there's also something in between. Um, it's, it's an, it functions as an online database but it's also a virtual exhibition. For instance, uh, the UM Special Collections Library has the United States and its territories, uh, and some of the Wooster images are also found in, in this particular um, online uh, resource. And of course, uh, you have stock photography sites, uh, the National Geographic sells images, um, so meaning you have a basket, a cart, and then you can buy the images of the uh, materials published at the National Geographic, and Corbis Image is also doing the same thing out of the National Geographic stock photos. 
And then, of course, there are, you know, one example is a personal site on a Flickr account by this particular person that would have Wooster images as well. So Wooster is definitely alive in the virtual world, and it's there, and it's floating. And, and depending on your uh, capacity to find something online, Wooster is there, or his images. Now, um, my particular project looks at this process called virtual reunification. And this is the most basic definition I found of this uh, process, uh, which is allowing dispersed collections to be brought together. And in, in my case, uh, the Wooster images are, would be the perfect candidate for virtual reunification. And what can we do to, to, to make it happen? That was my preliminary uh, question. And it's, it's a highly collaborative endeavor. It will require all collecting institutions or heritage um, institutions to work together, come up with a common um, strategy of digitizing everything and putting them online on top of the infrastructure that's already in place in these respective institutions. And of course, harness the affordances of the digital. Um, I have to qualify the term primitives here. Uh, John Unsworth is, <laughs> given the context of our conference, uh, John Unsworth is a, a pr prominent um, uh, personality in, 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 in the digital humanities world. And what, what he means by uh, primitives here, uh, actually he borrows from Aristotle, which is um, mainly, um, plainly speaking, um, about um, methods or tactics that scholars use in order to find m and interpret materials. So this is what he means by primitives. That's why I'm putting it in quotes because I don't want to be misunderstood or people to uh, call Unsworth uh, white supremacist, whatever. <laughs> so anyway, so, and he, he gave these, uh, you know, a list of things that humanists and scholars do in order to discover and interpret materials. And he was basically saying that these are, uh, we need to create tools that will help scholars do these things to discover materials, to annotate them, compare them, refer them, sample them, and illustrate them, and represent them. And I, I'm asking this question uh, for instance, how can virtual reunification do this given the context of the images? Because uh, on one hand, it's really important for serious scholars to be able to look at the images, compare them, annotate them, etc. And for uh, collecting institutions, heritage professionals and administrators to be able to do their work uh, using technology. But at the same time, um, we've heard earlier like uh, um, the, the concern that you don't want all of these images to be just floating in the web. So how do we balance all these interests? So virtual reunification literature, if you, are, you want to do uh, some serious uh, literature review of, of this field, would have um, certain um, limitations. So first, we don't have a model for uh, reunification of photographic collections yet. We have lots of models in the textual re realm. For instance, uh, the Walt Whitman Archive is one example of virtual reunification because you know the Whitman text would be scattered in different libraries and they try to combine all the text together and the different editions of the Leaves of Grass, etc. That's all in place, but for images, we don't have it. Um, people like to talk about using repatriate, uh, uh, reunification for repatriation but we really don't know what it means, uh, especially if you talk about images of indigenous peoples taken 100 years ago, who would be the s spokesperson for that indigenous community? If you go to the Philippines and say, I want to find the Bontoc Igorot and say, is this a photo of your relative? Is that really the person to talk to and consult and say, will you allow us to put it online? Is it the Philippine government? Is it the National Museum? Is it us, people in this room? That's hard to answer. Anyway, this is uh, my research. I was looking at the challenges and barriers to reunification and what, what, what are these barriers. And I'm only presenting one barrier that uh, I've discovered, which is basically the notion of dispersion and what it means to have a collection that's dispersed. 
I've looked at 10 institutions. I've listed them down um, by type of collection and function or mission or what they do. And so this is the heart of my talk this afternoon, basically talking about uh, when you say dispersion, we actually mean four dimensions of, of dispersion as far as the Worcester collection is concerned. First, uh, the most obvious, of course, is geographic, uh, that it's scattered in different places. Now, I only studied 10 places. There should be more, and we should discover more places that, that would have the Worcester images. And I'll explain to you why it's difficult to find them. So this is what I have so far in my dissertation. As you can see, I mentioned earlier that Haverford, Haverford College um, has an online exhibition, yet it's not part of my sample because when I was uh, still doing this, you know, data gathering for my research, an undergraduate student came and said, hey, you know, we have a, a Worcester collection or Martin collection in there. And I said, I'm not going to go back and <laughs> interview you. I'm done data gathering, so I'll just finish at this 10 institution because it's neat and it's 10, it's well-rounded and all that. <laughs> Otherwise, I won't be done. Uh, another notion of dispersion is that it's providential. Um, so, for instance, um, so I have this kind of visualization. So you ha it, they all came from Wooster at some point, but they came through other intermediaries, either a relative, like Alice Day, a daughter, uh, and you know the image from her went to the Bentley Library. Frederick is the son. Edward Eyre purchased uh, images from Worcester and gave it to the Newberry Library and then instructed the Field Museum to make copies of the prints at the Newberry. Um, Lucen also purchased uh, from uh, uh, his set from Worcester. And now it, it's now in Germany. Uh, Charles Martin, I think, directly uh, provided. Oh, I think that's. Yeah, I switched them. Sorry. So it's uh, the UPenn Museum is through Charles Martin and Forbes uh, through the Peabody, uh, the Peabody Museum through Cameron Forbes. I'm sorry about that. I, sh I should have been more careful. Um, so, but. Looking at the different places and the different metadata that they have, and this is not the complete list, um, and uh, you you will actually notice, as you know, pointed out earlier, um, that there are other people associated with uh, the Wooster images, people who took the photos themselves, other than the perceived owner. Uh, and this is uh, interesting for me as an archivist because we have this notion of provenance, and it's an important notion within the archival field, but how we apply this notion of provenance is actually different in different places. So um, one rule of provenance is that you put the records donated by an individual to your institution under the person's, uh, under the donor's name. So that's why Wooster's photos became also part of the Forbes photo uh, collection at uh, Peabody because he was the donor and that's an obvious um, uh, way of following the principle of provenance in archives. But there are also photographers who actually quote unquote created those images that need to be acknowledged within these albums or uh, collection of prints. So another uh, dimension to dispersion uh, of the Worcester images would be temporal. Um, it, uh, that it's, it came to different places at different points in time. So as you can see, the earliest collection I've seen, and I don't know if anyone in the room um, would tell me that if there's anything earlier than 1902, but I think the ver it's safe to say that the very first set of images came to the National Anthropological, uh, well, now with the National Anthropological Archives, but before it was the U.S. National Museum. And then moving forward, the, the, I think the last batch should be with uh, the U.M. Museum of Anthropology, the, the collection of uh, class negatives. But the negatives actually came by way of the American Museum of Natural History. There's an interesting story to that. Um, um, 
Wooster, when he was alive, tried to sell the images. Oh no, the son tried to sell the images to the university. The University of Michigan said, no, we can't afford it. He was trying to sell it for $5,000. And as soon as the Board of Regents of the University of City said no, he calls up the American Museum of Natural History in New York and says, I want to put my father's negatives on a uh, uh, long-term loan. You can use whatever you want, but I'm not donating it to you. Would you keep it? And you know, as he grew older, approaching 60s, he said, I don't think anyone would want to buy <laughs> the negatives of my father. So he said, okay, let's, let's give it back to the University of Michigan instead of uh, selling it. So they donated it to uh, the university. Uh, from the Bentley, it went to the Museum of Anthropology. What I don't seem to understand now is how and why the Bentley decided to give it to the museum instead of keeping it with the Bentley. So space. Okay, so <laughs> I need to find, uh, you know, like a correspondence or an archival, uh, but I, c I couldn't find any. And of course, another notion of uh, dispersion is material, that, you know, there's not one format to this uh, Wooster images. Uh, in some places, the Wooster images are um, bound in scrapbooks and that there are prints. Sometimes they are um, like in loose, uh, folders like that, um, or sometimes they're in the form of a lantern slide, or sometimes they're, you know, I at Michigan here we have the glass negatives, et cetera, and, and that's, that's also a problem, and that's something that we need to think about. Um, how different is the negative from the print, or a copy negative of a print, like for instance, what they have at the Field Museum are actually copies of the prints at the Newberry Library. So, so here's a print, and then you make a negative out of the print, and that's the copy negative. So, uh, but, but these are all, if you think about it, these are all unique items, right? They're, they all have their own histories and uses in their respective institutions. Uh, just to give you an overview of the diversity of the Wooster collection, when we say Wooster images, <laughs> Uh, at least in the 10 institutions I, I, I studied. So you have prints and uh, accompanying uh, typewritten index, et cetera. So, so this is what we really mean and the whole infrastructure of the Wooster collection when we say Wooster images. So anyway, so what does it mean? What does it mean to reunify uh, the Wooster collection? Um, I, I do think that part of the um, um, answer to this question is to, you know, again, I think we, we need to uh, go back and understand in the first place why they are dispersed and the different reasons why they're dispersed. Um, and perhaps uh, for, for me, uh, the, the real interesting question for me is that um, when do we use technology to answer um, social questions? you know, deep fundamental questions that we have, and then how can technology help us find solutions, right? So, because um, when, when I go to all these different institutions, it becomes about priorities and, uh, and goals and target outputs, how much money we have, and if, if technology can do this for us, which is understandable, um, then, but the, the, the problem is how do we consolidate all of these priorities and missions and different uh, identities of, of these institutions and so that we can work together and try to show, you know, wh what are the images uniquely found in this institution? And what, what images are um, appearing in uh, you know, in, s in several formats and several iterations in which institutions and how can that kind of discovery facilitate deeper understanding and interpretation of the Wooster collection and where does technology and when does technology help us do this? Um, 
I'll show you just one hint of one illustration I did on the, the how different people tried to articulate the different levels of access that they perceive, like the basic, basically who gets to see what of the Wooster images. So this is my level of access, like limited and full. Uh, level of priority, these are um, for many uh, owning institutions, they think that they should have the highest priority of access to all collections and that their access should be full. And second would be, if, they, if we cannot do this, then we cannot show to the source communities the, the very subject, quote unquote, of these images, uh, the materials that we have, so they're the second. So there's still the high priority and full access. And then at, as we go down the list, you have researchers and scholars should be like in the middle, trying to you know, navigate through uh, uh, you know, what they can see and we can filter it for them. But the very uh, last priority among people I interviewed would be the general public. That there's much concern about uh, showing everything to everyone. But it seems to me that it's not really happening that way uh, online, that many of the images that we see are you know, available for the general public to see. So what do we do? We, we cannot censor certain places. Um, we, uh, I don't think it's my work to police the internet. <laughs> um, but perhaps we can have a, a, s a starting point, a conversation on you know, how do we prioritize access and understand who gets to see what as far as the Worcester images are concerned. Thank you. <laughs> this is a feat because I never coughed the whole time. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for keeping up. I'm the last <laughs> presenter for today. Um, all right, I'm going to talk about the social uh, lives of uh, Worcester photographs outside of the archives and bringing back to these photographs to the field. No? Right, so between... Um, uh, there are two terms that I'd like to stress uh, from the narratives of the people when they saw the, the Worcester images for the first time. First is the word takus awi, which means people from the past. And the other one, uh, takus means, taku is people, and awi means past. So it means people from the past. And the other word, other phrase is takus sasana, which means people of the present. So what connects uh, the taku, takusawi, takusawi and the takusasana are the memories uh, that we can derive from the Worcester photographs. So we are the takusasana, people of the present interpreting the images of the past. Right. Between 1903 to 1906, D.N.C. Worcester, an American colonial official, journeyed through the mountains of the northern Luzon, recording the people's appearances, customs, and material culture. The American administrators were in need of precise and detailed information about the islands and their populations in their charge, and for this purpose created a variety of institutions to collect da data. One of the major um, institutions created for this pur purpose, uh, like what was mentioned this morning, was the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes, renamed the Bureau of Ethnological Survey in 1903. The Bureau was in charge with the task of reporting on the conditions of the Muslim and pagan tribes, recommending legislation for their governance, and accumulating knowledge of Philippine ethnology. Worcester, who became the Bureau of Chief in 19. O three took interest in the archipelago's tribal peoples, particularly the Igorots of northern Luzon. So you can see here, uh, Kalinga is my field site. That's where I did my uh, most of my research. But the area around it is northern Luzon. 
and they were lumped uh, under Worcester's category as the Igorots, whom he described as, I quote, savages, primitive, and illiterate, though perfectly harmless and peaceful and honest. So he was able to travel uh, from Kalinga in Lubwagan, that's in the northern part, in Bontok, Ifugao, Benguet, which includes other towns, Kapangan, Kabayan, Atok, La Trinidad, and Baguio, my hometown, including Abra. What I did was to bring the photographs to where Worcester went in the early 1900s and uh, talk to the people what they think about these images. Meantime, from these visits to northern Luzon, Worcester was able to compile an extensive photographic record of the Philippine ethnic groups and left some 16,000 black and white photographs taken between 1898 and 1913, including a massive collection of artifacts. About 200 of these photographs are of tattooed igorots taken in mugshot style, front and profile views with a white background. These photographs, may, many of them, have been published in the National Geographic, as we all know, entitled Headhunters of Northern Luzon and the Non-Christian Tribes of the Philippine Islands. These two articles had a political impact when the issue of Philippine independence was revived, revived in 1912. The article written by Worcester himself contains 85 photographs of tribal Filipinos and their implicit theme is the readiness of the Filipinos for independence. The photographs include 25 photographs of bare-breasted women with tattoos, mostly from the, uh, from the Igorot group, photos of headhunters, and the famous photograph of the headless Ifugao that was shown by uh, Mike a while ago, which served well to showcase not only the colonized subject, but also the ethnocentric eye behind the lens. Worcester's approach to non-Christian tribes of the Philippines was based on the 19th and 20th century conceptions of race and evolution. As such, the photographs reflect the paradigms of social evolutionism, racism, and paternalism. However, the Worcester photographs as eth ethnographic recordings of people with no available written records were primarily anthropological documentations that became valuable to the American colonial administration. In the photographs um, that I examined, there are a lot of features that tells us about the material culture of the, the Igorots. Um, like for instance, uh, you have the chakang, which is not identified in the photograph. These are gold sheets that women would place on their teeth. So when they smile, they actually is a feature of their affluence during uh, big feasts. And then the tinali, or the beaded arm ornaments of the tingian in Abra. This is Machalum with his durao, the headdress. The lingling o, or the gold earrings, and the dile, which are the prestige blankets uh, wo uh, worn on ritual dancing. So as you can see, uh, there are, uh, it has a very rich uh, inventory of visual material culture found in the Worcester images. In, 2000, in 2004, on the occasion of the centennial of the 1904 St. Louis Fair, I had the opportunity to examine closely the more than 5,000 black and white images from the Worcester Photographic Collection here at the University of Michigan, plus uh, Carla Sinopolis CD-ROM that was produced in 1988, uh, which proved to, to be useful in my research. The Worcester Photographic Collection is particularly important because of the ways of seeing that the photographs represent directly fed into the major metropolitan project the 1904 St. Louis Exposition in Missouri, more importantly known as the World's Fair. In the fair, a group of various ethnic groups such as the Bontoc, Lipanto, Igorots, and the Tingians were lumped together as Igorotes. During the centennial of the fair in 2004, photographs of Worcester on the Igorots and the Igorots in the fair, such as this, resurfaced in books and internet sites. 
In 2006, I embarked on the field's research and brought some of these photographs to the communities for photo elicitation. Nonetheless, in this paper, I argue that the photographs provide substantial visual evidence of the Igorot's way of life and as such are effective attempts at photo elicitation of current anthropological fieldwork. Worcester photographs elicit, uh, elicit extends research inv investigation because the images represent, like I said, a rich visual inventory of material culture. It produces a different kind of information, specifically in evoking emotions, feelings, and memories. And it also bridges uh, the lived experiences of contemporary life ways of the local people, uh, specifically among the Igorots. I also would like to uh, put the stress on uh, the idea of objects as things in motion from Apadurai and Kopitov, that uh, certain objects have social biographies of, the of their own as they relate to relevant socioeconomic, cultural, and political contexts across time. So like um, Worcester photographs, also have social biographies or social lives when these are brought out from the archives to the field to acquire new meanings. Like for instance, acquiring uh, the specific names of what used to be anonymous, uh, the place names, uh, the, the objects, the names of the objects that were used um, based on these photographs. So in a way, um, uh, taken out from the archives, some are uploaded in the internet, like what uh, Ricky said, uh, local people, uh, university students from Baguio City who come from these areas would download them, print them, and appropriate that, uh, these images as a form of social or individual identity. I'll, I'll show you samples later on. So engaging, engaging the Worcester photographs in the field allowed for the discovery of deeper meanings of Igorot material culture on the basis of meaningful analysis and rigorous examination. So what did I do uh, f uh, with these images? I reproduced them to uh, like a regular five or sizes and smaller versions of those photographs. And these are the ones that I carried to the field. So the journey begins traveling to the Cordillera. From my hometown, you go to Bontok by bus. Then you get to the villages by uh, jeepney, top load. And you get to the, the villages through a motorbike or hiking with all the photographs on my backpack. So I reached isolated, remote villages. Uh, this is one. Uh, this is a place in uh, southern Kalinga called Tinglayan. This is also the home of the now famous 90-year-old uh, tattoo practitioner, uh, Apu Wang Ud, who would tattoo um, tourists coming in uh, for a few So you walk all the way uh, for three hours going to the village. And this is my field site. There's uh, My field house is somewhere there where I live for almost uh, 16 months. So I also participated with the people's lives in there. Uh, feeding the hogs and everything, and also of doing photo elicitation. This is a method in visual anthropology. So photo elicitation is based on the idea of inserting a photograph as a prompt into a research interview. This is also used as, as a device for generating more important verbal information in the interview. So this is uh, practically like a an afternoon session, coffee session with the elders, uh, with the children, with the tattoo art, tattoo practitioner, um, military men, and the children. So they have uh, participated in this photo elicitation project. Okay. So the Worcester photographs, including the photographs that I produced while on field work, were used to recover oral narratives and prompt memories that challenged the initial colonial understanding of the Igorot people in the past. 
following Bart's phenomenological mode, photographs can rupture or break complacency, complacency and inspire a more emotionally charged response. Photographs then become a form of interlocutor, literally unlocking memories and emerge in multiple soundscapes, allowing the sounds to be heard and thus enabling knowledge to be passed down and validated. In this paper, I provide examples where the photographs, where the Worcester photographs are used as a form of another way of telling. So the iconicity of tattoos and the homecoming of Wanawan. So here, um, I brought the wor Worcester photographs that depict Igorot subjects with their tattoos and other evidence of material culture in the field. These images connect an individual to experiences or periods that portray the iconicity of the tattoos found on their skins to the similar tattoos found in the photographs. As such, the use of Worcester photographs was able to connect, the, I quote, the core definitions of the self to society, culture, and history. This is a quote from Harper. So uh, when elders would look at the photographs, they would look at the image intently, and they would look at their tattoos. And you see the semblance of the same uh, or similar tattoo patterns found on the photograph and on their skins. So this is a way of eliciting a uh, response no, emotionally or verbal information when doing this particular method. So the elders were touching the images and looked at it intently. As Collier pointed out, I quote, the pictures elicited longer and more comprehensive intervie interviews. At the same time, the subjects uh, elicit more emotions. For instance, following an in-depth interview, I showed a photograph to Apo Chanao. This is Apo Chanao on, your, on the right. Uh, she is a Manchachawak or a female shaman and healer in the village in southern Kalinga. And I brought the photograph of Wanawan. A Kalinga warrior that remained anonymous all throughout the Worcester articles. I, ol I only had two specific questions to Apu Chanao. What do these tattoos mean and where did they come from? Apu Chana looked at the photograph for a long time, and at one instance, she touched and pointed out the tattoos found on the warrior's chest and arms. She volunteered a lot of valuable information, and she told me that the word tinulipao is an appropriate term to refer to the snake pattern pointing to her own tattoos on her arm, to the, che to the tattoos found on Wanawan's one on one's chest and arms. She also mentioned an, a very important word, which is called naparkuan, which is an old term to refer to the ancestors, literally meaning where the people would come from. So if you, if you would look at the snake pattern, if you draw a, a human stick, and if you combine that, those are, the actual, uh, those are ancestors holding together. So it is the naparkuan. Uh, which she explained as uh, the most coveted uh, tattoo symbol that informs the wearer and the onlooker that the ancestors protect the person with this kind of tattoos. To elucidate further, Apochano also pointed to Wanawan's uh, uh, photograph and Tattooed elders also corroborate this point by bearing uh, the weeing on their chest. Now, when I brought this, uh, this image to other villages, there were also older elderly men who have similar tattoos with that of Wanawan. So it was able to identify different terms, uh, different tattoo designs, and different meanings for this particular tattoo symbol. Of course, uh, tattoo cannot be earned overnight. It has to be earned. Uh, throughout no, many years of uh, hard work or whatever, bravery. Furthermore, when I visited uh, the village of Tulgao in Tinglayan in southern Kalinga, 
I was unaware that this is the hometown of the renowned, renowned warrior Wanawan. While conducting my interviews with the elders there, a group of elderly women joined in to look at the photographs, and to their consternation, they found a photograph of Wanawan, the same photograph with the previous slide. They paused, touched, and looked at the photograph intently and said, Takus Awi, ancestors of the past. And as if like a homecoming, an immediate chatter from the crowd was evident with an, an enthusiastic burst. Sija a Wanawan, Sija ana amatayu. This is Wanawan, this is my father or our father. With a gush of emotion, the elders declared and agreed that it was Wanawan indeed, recognizable with his facial tattoos uh, found on her on his face. This seems to be a compelling effect of the graphic imagery, the ability to prod latent memory to stimulate and release emotional statements. With this combined uh, in-depth interviews, the local people were a also able to identify other tattoos. Okay, so this is one hour one after 1912 photograph. Uh, this was taken around 1940s. So they were also able to identify um, the tattoos and uh, the ayung, which is the facial tattoos found on his cheeks, which is considered a very rare tattoo. Wanawan's facial tattoo made him renowned in the village. According to the Tulgao elders, this fame earned him the name Iruruup, literally means face mask or the face of an owl, because his facial tattoos reminded them of an owl. A, for, a fortuitous creature as, they, as the cry of an owl is seen as a good omen before the heading for bat battle. To the best of the elders' knowledge, it was only Wanawan who gave the Ayung tattoos after he led a group of Tulgao men in warfare against the Lubo in the 1930s. This is cited in Barton, 1949. In the Sabbath, or the face-to-face -face combat uh, at the time and place agreed by, agreed by both parties near the Chico River, Wanawan single-handedly took the head of the enemy chief while others reti retreated to avoid total defeat. The Tulgao group ended by victorious because of Wanawan's display of bravery. In the village, Wanawan's bravery is highly esteemed by his children and village elders in Tulgao. Even the younger generation knows his story. According to his daughter, Paai, Wanawan wanted to be a model of bravery, and Ayung is the visual display of a true nakem or sensibility and responsibility for the village. Wanawan remained a pangat, or a tribal leader, until his death in the 1980s. Wanawan wanted the younger warriors to emulate him and internalize what it meant to be a Kalinga brave. So this is the photograph of Wanawan in the 1970s until his death in uh, the mid-1980s. This is also Wanawan attending the first, uh, the graduation of his first grandson in the 1970s. This is found in uh, a, family, a family album in the village. Wanawan's 1913 photograph is very much connected with the circulation of the image of the Kalinga as headhunters. He was photographed by Dean Worcester in the early 1900s and first appeared in the National Geographic, published in 1913, and was widely circulated thereafter. However, the subject's identity remained unknown, and he was merely labeled as, I quote, Kalinga Fierce Headhunter, until my recent visit to the village of Tulgao, where I found his children in the village. Wanawan's renown in the village extends to nearby Bontok and Kalinga villages, where he is revered as a respected warrior and elder. I gave the photograph of Wanawan to his family, who fully appreciated his homecoming. At the Bontok Museum, the photograph of Wanawan, along with other, with other tattooed Kalinga men and Bontok peace pack holders, are prominently displayed. So this is the photo of Wanawan in the museum, and some of the photographs of Worcester are also found uh, in the museum, Bontok Museum. 
Now, the image of Onawan also have been widely reproduced in different mediums and circulated in many publications in the contemporary period, but still these reproductions have remained anonymous. Recently, his photograph is uh, used as the front cover of a tattoo book in the Philippines. Onawan's photograph has been used in print adver adver advertisements for modern tattoo festivals in the cities. It has graced the cover of a CD a graphic design for a t-shirt. So that's the t-shirt. This is the t-shirt. Uh, so this is also an inspiration for an artwork that has uh, artwork and a sticker. In, in Baguio City. What is more compelling is that tattoos have also been appropriated in contemporary tattoo practices, both among the local people and tourists coming to get their tattoos in a remote village in Buscalan. There's no sound. So if you notice, the, the this is the design Tinulipao, which is appropriated now as a tattoo design. Oh, I didn't warn you about the flesh and blood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is the Tinulipao design uh, that you can find in Wanawan's uh, chest tattoos that are now being appropriated as a tattoo design. Yeah, it would. It w uh, for one hour tattoo, it would probably take around a day to finish an arm and uh, weeks to finish the chest because you cannot tattoo every day. So you have to rest for both of the tattooee and the tattoo artist until the the wounds get healed after some time. And of course, you have to prepare for pigs as a payment for the tattoo practitioner. So you don't don't go there and can I have my tattoo? No, you have to prepare <laughs> for that long process, and you have to pay. Right. So in my um, anthropological fieldwork, uh, I also use other tattooed images. And uh, uh, in my my Christ paper, this image appeared, and all uh, this also served as an inter interview stimuli because when they brought this. Um, image back to the field, they were able to identify who these people were. And I mentioned that in my forthcoming book coming out soon on June 2013. So here we can see that Worcester photographs demonstrated what Harper calls as, I, I quote, the polysemic quality of the image. So you can see here, uh, if the younger generation would not like to get tattoos because it's painful and it's expensive, they would use the felt tip pens, uh, download one hour's image, and uh, yeah, they can use this as a design. So this is the uh, festival, Panagbenga Festival in Baguio City. Hey. Recently, there is also an appropriation of these tattoos in colonial photographs uh, that are clearly in vogue among urban people. This is reminiscent of a photograph taken in the early 1900s. So again, uh, there are also uh, images of women with tattoos uh, from the Worcester collection. Okay, the tattooed woman, the photograph that this elderly woman is holding is identified as a woman from Lubwagan, taken by Worcester in the early 1900s. This image has been used as a popular hand-colored postcard in the 1900s, 
And uh, you can see there that I was able to get the names of these tattoo designs uh, from the interviews I did with the elderly women. Right now, um, there is also uh, a significant uh, representation of these photographs in, in fashion, like these t-shirts. No? The resultant uh, product shows the direct links of a distinctive identity as Kalinga uh, done in a different medium. So it is evident that this objectification of tattoos in t-shirts reflects the popularity of Kalinga tattoos in contemporary tattoo practice. Here, the graphicness of traditional tattoos becomes central to the design, i.e. they are transferred and mass-produced in t-shirts. So I also brought some, some mass-produced t-shirts with tattoos. This is another social life of uh, the social life of Worcester's uh, photographs. So there's another image. Uh, this is also a poster postcard in the 1900s, uh, photographed by Charles Martin, which was is also available on the internet, and they produced that as a form of T-shirts. No? So if there's a female version, there's also a male uh, Kalinga version. So uh, there you go. OK, so this is uh, another image, uh, which is similar to what you see on the t-shirts. Uh, this is a hand-colored postcard, uh, circa 1900s, that appeared in the National Geographic 1912. So what about the role of these photographs in archaeological fieldwork with Kabayan mummies? Uh, Dean Worcester also went to Kabayan area in Atok, where you can find the the, the tattooed mummies of Benguet, they are also found there. So the Worcester photographs were also operational in archaeological inquiry, specifically my research on the tattoos of the Kabayan mummies in Benguet. At the Kabayan Museum, uh, there is a massive photograph of a tattooed arm. The photograph is quite peculiar since the body to which the arm is connected has been cropped. I found the photograph interesting, especially as the tattooed arms juxtaposition against a white background set off the intricate patterns of the tattoo. However, what it lacked were the meanings and relevance of the tattoos to facilitate my understanding of the tattooing tradition among the Ibaloy or the Kankanai group. It had no captions, no indication of its provenance could be found. The only label that could be found was one which simply said, tattooed arm in bold print. Tattoos were frequently represented in the late 18th to 19th century engravings between disembodied arrays of buttocks, arms, legs, and faces, according to Thomas. The crop detail image of the tattooed arm shows the patterns in detail where the tattoos are placed on the body. Although the subjects subject is disembodied and reduced as an object, it could, for the contemporary viewer, serve evidence of the prevalent Ibaloi tattooing practices in the past. For example, the most arresting photograph taken by Worcester is this photograph, and also the impact of isolating parts of the body in the photograph thereby draws attention to the Igorot, specifically the Lepanto, Kankanai, or Suyok's uh, people's criminal skin is also eerie. Um, some of the images are cropped, no? and then if you look at the body <laughs> where this cropped arm comes from is, you can see there. So this uh, features the before and after process of uh, a tattooed arm of an unknown Bontok woman. So in my research, I tried to look for the owner <laughs> of this cropped arm. <laughs> and thanks to Carla, uh, the other day, I found some useful images to connect the tattooed cropped arm with this Lepanto Igorot woman posing with her tattooed arm against a white background. So the style and, uh, of fragmentation and, uh, and objectification centers on the imposition of secondary meaning upon the photographic image proper. This is elaborated at different levels of photographic production, like selection. 
selection, cropping, etc. So um, I showed this photograph uh, to the women in Banao and Suyuk in Benguet. So I traveled there in uh, the purpose of eliciting what these tattoos mean. And they gave me these interesting names for the tattoos, like the stars, the carbo jawbone, rice mortar, baskets, lines, seeds, farm trails, and terraces, which is an indication of their, let's say, fertility in agriculture and fertility of the women uh, participating in such activities. And only the tattooed uh, person who have these kinds of tattoos are the more affluent um, people among the Iba lawyer, Kankanai. But in, in the photographs, it f it's like uh, a criminal skin. No, you get this because you're a criminal in some of the annotations done in, in the images. So similar tattoo patterns, surprisingly, are also found on the mummies of Kabayan Benguet, specifically on the tattoos of uh, the this female adult mommy found in the Timbak Rock shelter, and also the tattoos of uh, Apu Anu. Okay, I, I wrote a separate essay on the tattoos of the mummies uh, in Benguet. Okay, just to show you briefly, uh, this is Kabayan. Uh, uh, they are buried. Um, so these are the mummies as well. And you can see here the tattoos are similar with the photographs found on Worcester. So this is the Kabayan Museum now, and the tattoos are also found there. Okay, the last part of the paper is about the live realities of an Igor funerary blanket. So this is a photograph uh, taken by Worcester in 1902. For, uh, 1900s. No, uh, the caption is "Valuable Igorot Blanket" uh, that shows the relative size and the blanket cost 25 pesos, uh, which to date in, uh, is equivalent to in the past equivalent to two carabaos. So it must be very expensive to buy this blanket. And also a photograph of Mora riding my horse. Uh, Bob is Bob is Worcester's horse. No, so they, this is a display of. Uh, of uh, uh, affluence uh, in this village. So the funerary blanket are now identified as Adashang among the Ibaloy, Aladang in Kankanai, Uwes Pinoktuan in Isinai, and Kunitian in Ifugao. So there's, uh, what I wanted to find out in this research is to look at the ritual connections, uh, the translocal connections and ritual use of these blankets. And the blankets are used as funerary shrouds and are traded to different villages. So this is how the ikat dyed aladang looks like. And uh, also with the interviews with the women, they also showed uh, from their albums you know, how these are worn and these are woven by a widow. And so it stopped at a certain generation. And uh, due to Christianity, the blanket was erased or were not used and they substituted the blanket with a black cloth to wrap the disease in. So these are the interviews I conducted with the elders there. And um, in that experience, I was not allowed to spread out uh, the blanket inside the house for fear of inviting the spirits, no? Because it would it entail elaborate rituals and feasting to, to have this. So the Mambunong at the center with striped shirt, uh, he's examining the the designs and the number of days that this uh, probable deceased person would be buried, no, uh, will, will have his funeral. So this is about 13 stars, which means 13 days for a week, so which, which is very interesting. So the, since there are no uh, ikat dyed blankets, local weavers in Ginsadan also weave this, this blanket already at a cost. And um, there's a video here of, uh, of the Isinai group. Oh, 
Why is it opening everything? Okay, meantime to conclude. Okay, this is uh, the current version of the Isinai blanket now because the they cannot weave this uh, with similar patterns with the one you find in the Worcester photograph. So what they did was to copy the design and silk screen everything. Uh, so this is very important for the Isinai's group uh, group's claim for identity. So to conclude, since my time is up, uh, uh, this shows the potential of the use of images as ethnographic material in anthropological fieldwork that prefers new meanings and interpretations. So in other words, um, the Worcester photographs proved to be useful even after the colonial relations have been abandoned and the narratives and the stories of the people contribute to this ad additional contextual information about Igorot material culture. Thank you. Um, I'd like to have a few sentences about what is going on uh, about Worcester and Philippine studies. Um, it's very easy. Our panel has explored the complexity of the Worcester photographic materials and their potential dissemination. The assortment of sources beyond the times of Worcester become far more problematic, less engaged, and focused, very tame. Thus, thank goodness we have, an, we have the easily approachable Worcester. So many photos, so many words, in so many forms no today's conference without him. In this regard, few individuals and fewer institutions are his equal in his, in his or our own times. In her fine curatorship for the China trade exhibit at Baker, Ms. Banta speak, speaks of the Agustin Head and Company, and I quote, it's staggering. The company kept everything. Mo and, uh, close quotation, most importantly for us, Harvard has it. Philippine research has no equivalent, but, but we do have Wooster, and in his letter from, the New York, from New York of July 8, 1914, to President Hutchins, shows his great desire for the preservation and safekeeping of records, for he had experienced how easily they can be lost and lost by one and all. Due to 44 years of dealing with Filipiniana, a certain vantage point on Philippine sources has come my way. I have listened to hundreds upon hundreds of professors and students from here and abroad formulate exhaustive research desires for which no sources exist or at best only a folio full. For the Philippines generally, some resources are well preserved. Most are not, most are not, and the great majority lost forever due to massive, massive disinterest. Willful destruction, neglect, fire, water, bugs, conflict, greed, theft, nationalism, colonialism, and missing in transit for a period of 500 years. Of course, many of the desirables were never created. Looked at from the vantage point of tangible sources, I see mostly rupture, fragments, no sign of the need to claim to fight phantom meta-narratives. While the sources feature the absence of obvious continuities, librarians and researchers must give up a group of documents, regardless of how one defines documents, close attention, and ultimately some genuine coherence. In short, a commitment to contribute to serious schol scholarship as is for the ages. So I go back to the question. Uh, my question to Ms. Banda, uh, based on the report or the, uh, the things that I have, I was a little bit confused because you quote at length from Professor Brody's building empire 
Architecture and American Imperialism in the Philippines. At the beginning of his article, he himself quotes Daniel Burnham, which is in quote, the dive into the Orient has been like a dream, unquote. I think you can make a case that Mr. Brody is also dreaming. Brody initially uses American and European fantasies of the early and late 20th century, century, be they be the thoughts of the Wooster era, Mr. Burnham, to today's Professor McClinton erasing the Filipino past. Then he moves on to seeing schools, hospitals, ho and hotels as imperative way houses to modu modulate US citizens having to deal with the alien other. Meanwhile, back on terra firma in the early 20th century Philippines, particularly the very early years, most Americans and Worcester in particular failed to encounter such modulations. Brody treats the era as if it were a time of risk, adverse 21st century tourist. Brody's source for which is indeed from writers of today's tourist. Brody simply inserts the phrase colonial tourist. What does this article have to do with the two early 20th century humans named Forbes and Wooster? That's my first question. My second question, you have an article in the IIAS which expresses a, a point of view in, taken from your book from site to site with Curtis Hensley about anthropology and photogra photography and has the prose proper for an exhibition catalog. In light of the morning's forum and the recent Nap Napoleon Chagnon memoir entitled Noble Savages, My Life Among Two Dangerous Tribes, the, the Yanomano and anthropologist and Marshall Salim's resignation from the National Academy of Sciences due to Chagnon's election, both have close association with the University of Michigan. What is your present thoughts on, the, on anthropology and its relationship with photography? Okay, so that's you. Okay. <laughs> then I'll go to Mike. Okay, I know Mike, so I have to say Mike rather than Mr. Price. For several decades, they have both tenacity and patience. Mr. Price has developed a profound knowledge of not only photographs of Philippine people and places, but also visual media, especially postcards. Today, we have been beneficiary of that knowledge. First question, from what you already know, or perhaps what you have to date only read, but as yet been unable personally to view, what would be the most rewarding avenues of research to pursue with the image, images we have now and those we may have in the future? And by images, I do not mean simply photos, but also postcards. Second question, I'm curious. Do you really think that Worcester, us Worcester, made no difference? That only one else of a similar frame of mind, not personality or presence, would have made no difference at all? If so, please inform us. <laughs> okay, for Ricky. Oh, Ricky, it was hard to do this. <laughs> because we were, I was, we were both doing different things. Okay, Mr. Punsalan took, uh, um, can I just say Ricky? I'm older than you, so I can do it. <laughs> Ricky took on a Herculean task and managed manage it so well. A caveat though, all Southeast Asianists should be forewarned. Numerous digitized documentation is not coming to the screen near you. In addition, Mr. Ponsalan with his professor Paul Conway has addressed the downright adversarial tension between digital library creators who view visual images as fixed, very 19th century science style, against users who see evidential sources as fluid and variable. In short, as a human endeavor best approached inside the academy via a good understanding of cognition in terms of language and perception. 
though since late 1970s, many in the humanities have followed a less fruitful Western European imposed path located 600 kilometers east-northeast of Brest. So query number one, Ricky, you are concerned about the intersection among archives, communities, and collection, collective memory in addition to the virtual reunification of archives. It's, it's a tandem with Ikin. I, I already asked permission from Ikin to call her Ikin. Uh, Ikin has introduced photos to the community which have delivered so much meaning to their lives. Moreover, you, Ricky, have enumerated the stumbling, stumbling blocks on the way it's comprehensive integration. You are clearly, certainly to be commended for clearly outlining the issues. However, taking into account the d various dilemmas that still exist, what is your best professional judgment about accomplishing delivering results via virtual means to Ikens for use with the communities and her students in Baguio. Okay, I get Ikin. Ooh, I forgot about Ikin. Ooh. Ikin. I should have put this one, but I cannot. Um, I would like to introduce Ikin as the most famous member of the panelists. Last April, Miss Salvador Amores. At the time, uh, last April, uh, Ikin uh, was receiving her PhD from Oxford, was prominently featured on ABS-CBN News, and interv interviewed by one and only Rose Esclarin. But I have not, but I, I will do it later. So your query, number one, which I, you have made an exceedingly close examination of these historical photos, a, a reading using emission, em, Emerson, Smith, and Banks work on qualitative research led you to see the widespread use of photos in purely illustrative archival or documentary ways. In contrast to your own use of photos in anthropological research, which gave a more analytical treatment and regards photos as raw materials or as visual material that forms a significant part in qualita qualitative research. Would you please expand on what you mean and why it holds such overarching importance for you? Second query. Your research demonstrates its benefit for scholarship, but much work then it shows not only your work, active relevance to the Igorots and their communities whose ancestors with their photographs, but also the real possibility that, that they will start documenting via photographs and film their own culture in the future, right? So uh, due to the above then, my th third qu query, and looking back to the Worcester era, do we have any written record or oral traditions concerning how the Igorot ancestors reacted to Worcester? So they know or care who took their fo ancestors' photos. Have you shown your people's photos that present Worcester beside an individual with tattoos? Why not? Are you anxious about the reaction? In short, for them, Worcester has disappeared or never existed, or became a shadow. Is that correct? So those are my questions. Huh? I don't know. The, the four you can, can decide. Well, I can take them About your second question, um, when I, I worked on a publication in the 80s, can you hear me? OK. Um, called from site to site, and um, I was working at the Peabody Museum at the time, and it it was so evident at how little interest there was in the photograph collections, and it was a collection of half a million images, and even the administration really didn't care about it at all. And it, it was not only true at the Peabody, but really all over Harvard and probably all over the United States that there wasn't so much interest in photography. 
I think that began to change in 1989 when the 150th anniversary of photography came and people began to reassess their collections. But the reason I did that book really with Curtis Hinsley was to, um, you know, bring exposure to this extraordinary collection and um, to show its value to, to the museum itself, to Harvard and to the outside world. And it, I think it really did help and, and make a difference. And since that time, um, I've done a lot of work at Harvard with different archives. And it's, I've made four trips around the university. There's eight million photographs at Harvard and 50 different repositories. And over the course of the 25 years I've been at Harvard, it's been wonderful to see the change in people's attitudes over time about their photograph collections and the new technologies allowing us to share images and the interdisciplinary approach that people are taking so that people are now using the Peabody's collections um, from all kinds of disciplines and there's much more you know, sharing and, and uh, use of research. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. <laughs> but so. That's a good answer, thank you. As I understand the, qu the question, I was asked if how much difference Worcester made if it had been, suppose we had been Worcesterless. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been um, different in detail for better or worse. But in terms of the con overall context of U.S. imperialism, the superstructure would, would, would have been almost the same. It may have been not one individual for 13 years. It may have been a succession of different individuals. And then if you look at the Philippine American history, from 1920 to 1928, the Governor General of the Philippines was Leonard Wood, who was a sole brother of Worcester in terms of American jingoism and unbridled um, capitalist exploitation, <coughs> so that if it had been someone else other than Worcester, then you would have had Leonard Wood institute the same types of policies as, as happened. So you would have to say Worcester was just a cog in the, in the, in the, um, on one of the wheels. Of course, as far as his, if you limit it just to his photography alone. His images are in each individual case probably um, individually unique, but there are so many other similar and related images available that we could um, <clears throat> reconstruct a ethnography of the Cordillera, as Ikin was talking about, from other photographers in a different way, perhaps, perhaps not as, as complete, but um, Worcester certainly contributed to that. But I wouldn't say that he was indispensable. Is that an adequate answer? <laughs> Maybe if I hadn't eat, overeaten at lunch, I would have been able to. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Because of all people in this room, I need this the most. So um, your question was, um, well, basically asking whether virtual reunification or anything virtual would actually bring home these images to her population. Um, well, apparently, I don't need to do much of that because she's already bringing it home. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, but, but I do understand and appreciate the question, and I've actually considered it. Um, for now, and somehow I've gotten into trouble for saying this, um, um, especially during my defense. Um, I said, I, m my desire is for, uh, to create a tool for institutions to do their work. Some of my um, colleagues in the archival studies program want me, want, would have wanted me to say that I wanna do this so I can, I can facilitate repatriation. But, but I told them, the thing is, if these institutions cannot work together and discover their own collections, repatriation will never happen. And imagining that repatriation could actually be fully appreciated by, or um, yeah, fully appreciated by, um, by digitizing everything and giving them uh, 
everything in the digital format is also, I think, an illusion. Um, I do think that um, I somewhat um, believe in institutions. That's why I want institutions to function better and for institution, uh, people working in institutions to um, be able to discover their own collections so that they can facilitate better ways of uh, bringing uh, uh, or providing access to their materials. Because the fact that Ikin could bring the images all the way to Kalinga is already a testament that somehow it's working, but what we need to do is to make it better using technology. Now, I, I really am not convinced that technology or digital technology or virtual technology will, will solve everything. Um, but it will help us do certain things, right? So th that's, that's my answer. Well, in response to Ricky, um, it's just fortunate that I'm, I'm invited to come here to see the collections. But uh, if you go to the libraries or librarians and other researchers, they don't have access to these materials. So that's why <laughs> we're going to get some copies uh, uh, for the libraries as well. Okay, meantime, um, two points for uh, Susan's questions. Uh, one on uh, the documentation and documentary um, as an overarching um, importance. No? We have to look at uh, documentary or documentation both as a practice and a process. Uh, like uh, this paper, uh, some of the papers this morning have looked at the photographs in the archives without really bringing this back to the community, the source community where they prob would probably have come from. I think that's the vantage point of being a researcher back in the Philippines and able to uh, look <coughs> not only the obvious but more on a deeper level of investigation. And then the second one is if there are, yes, uh, these photographs have been used um, uh, in many instances for the indigenous people, uh, the different groups in the region for their ancestral land claims. Uh, one of the provisions under the IPRA law of the nation state is to have um, cultural identity, linguistic ability, and their occupation in a space time immemorial. And these photographs are proofs of uh, that they have been in, the, in that place for a long time, especially in Baguio City where the Carino clans have uh, an issue on land claim, ancestral land claims. And a lot of, of these photographs have been used uh, to, uh, for that particular pur purpose. And then the third one, uh, what are the reactions of the people, uh, whether Worcester was there? Actually, uh, there were also some images the, the three cases that I mentioned in my presentation is one of the many cases. There are also other images with Worcester in the photographs, like uh, Bakidan in Kalinga with other group of uh, Kalinga warriors. I brought that all to the field in Lubwagan. And some of the elders uh, would say, uh, would call him, uh, some of the descendants, um, stories pass on to their children, would say that uh, the generic, uh, name for him is Ameliano or Americano or Purao or Pachi. Um, there are also white missionary, American missionaries, Belgian missionaries who came there, and the generic reaction is to call them as Purao or just a white person. So they have this uh, varied reactions, uh, people coming in to the village, and they're very gracious when they, they come over. Uh, a good example is uh, the descendants or the participants that I was able to interview two years ago when they participated in the 1904 uh, St. Louis Fair. And most of the materials that I've read uh, would say they are exploited while in the U.S., they were not fed in while in the U.S., they, were, they didn't have clothes while in the U.S. But in fact, if when I interviewed one of the uh, participants from Lepanto and Bontoc, they said they had fun. You know, they brought all the coins with them. Uh, as a salary, they brought clothes with them and they left all their uh, uh, traditional garb um, in the fair. So these are the actual the, the material uh, culture that are now in the different museums. So they carried along with them and they had fun. So that's the, I could just give some snippets of that reaction.
Can can I, can I say something? Because um, uh, you know, throughout the day, I've been uh, we've been talking about images here. Um, so one of the reasons why I chose to focus on images because as as a field, archival studies is very logo centric. It focuses on textual materials, and I I've been saying and lobbying for this and saying that we actually have millions of or billions of images hiding it, it constitutes a significant portion of what we term now in our profession as hidden collections. Um, but at the same time, I don't know, because I haven't heard this yet um, said by anyone, actually there's Worcester also recorded um, in, in, in the, in, on site. So um, I wonder if, you know, um, Rather than uh, other than focusing on the visual, we should probably also focus on the oral, uh, and um, I'm that's that's another project that I'm trying to do: discover where <laughs> the recordings would be. Knowing Worcester, I don't think he threw them away, so <laughs> they're probably somewhere. And and photographic evidence and his own writings would tell us that. He did all those recordings, and uh, it would be very interesting to know where those recordings are. And you know, I'm saying this in this room so that you know you can go and find it. Thank you.